thank you so much. It's my pleasure. As I said before, we are so honored to have you both here. And this particular moment, and so much need for discussion, reflection, and unity in our communities to be able to respond to the growing Bolivian crisis, and also to reflect on the hope flags and resistance and organizing taking place. But first, let's go back in time a bit. I want to know, and I'm sure everyone wants to know, when and how did the two of you meet? <laughs> Uh, 
500 billion dollars and half a trillion dollars that they uh, collectively own. These eight, these eight men. <laughs> think of what we could do in the world. So think of, think of, of the way in which we could begin to eradicate poverty and how we could, you know, address uh, the fact that uh, that uh, all over the world people are moving and rightfully so. And then there are those who, who seem to think that um, just because certain um, states have established borders, that, that these people can be designated as illegal human beings. There's no such thing as a So, so I think it only means to want to radically transform the world, to create um, a better future for everyone in the world. Thank you. What do you got? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't mind closing my eyes and thinking, what would it be to be a black woman, revolutionary and communist? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, that was all of that was on the, uh, you're out to like, that was the you wrote that. <laughs> you I've seen it on, I have seen it on some posters. <laughs> I have seen it on posters too. So. Well, this is the first time I've been reminded of this. So. I'm sorry if I can't remember everything that I wrote. <laughs> I'm gonna pull up that poster I saw it in. Um, but uh, I, what Chelly's you asked about, um, you know, the various uh, identities and, uh, I, I, I was just thinking that um, identity it can be such a powerful thing. I, I was telling someone that I, I, no one ever called me a Mexican in Mexico. Right. <laughs> I became a Mexican here. Yeah. So like, oh, you're a Mexican. Oh, okay. And so, so there's like things that kind of, <laughs> so, and yeah, because like, those are the things you don't have a choice of. I was born a Mexican. And then, but then they kind of call me Mexican-American. You know, it's like, okay, okay. And then, uh, so choosing uh, Chicana as an identity was really an act, of a, a political act uh, that, actually transcends uh, several things because in Mexico, once we left and we were pochos, you know, and, and like we had left and became traders and, and, uh, and then of course here we were, you know, dinners and other things. And so, so it was very important to, to adopt that, that identity um, uh, as Chicanas and, and, and Chicanos because that became our own term and it became our political identity as well as our social identity. And so I think that's what I think when you say, you know, to sort of like these things. And activists, I think I sort of like, I think since the time that I started working against the, 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 uh, the tracking system and also once I, heard about the United Farm Workers Union and having work, work, <laughs> grown up in the, in the labor camps. And, and, and I told, I've said this before, I didn't mind the hard work. I mean, it was hard work, I didn't mind it. What irked me to no end was the power relationship that the growers had over us, the workers, mm -hmm. and how many decisions they made uh, for us were over us. And so when I heard there was a, a union that was organizing uh, for the dignity of, of farm workers, I said, sign me up. And, uh, and, and I think have been at it um, uh, ever since. So, um, and like you sort of like, well, whoever I am, it's totally normal. It's, this is who I am. And, and to be able to, to love who you love and, 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 and be who you are, um, good thing that, that, uh, that we uh, have come to some of that point and they were able to do it here and not everybody can do it around the world. And so many of our brothers and sisters um, killed every day, harassed every day. Um, the LGBTQ care, part of the caravan coming uh, from Central America. I mean, we have to really pay attention to our brothers and sisters that are part of that part of our peoples that are coming because there are some additional things that we need to pay attention to in terms of how they're being treated and what's happening with them. Um, so I don't know if we'll answer the you question. Know, but, um, uh, 
I guess I might also say, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about this precisely as a result of your discussion of the, um, the uh, importance of identity, uh, uh, that, um, that I actually prefer the term black. I'm really ambivalent about the term African American. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. And, and I'm ambivalent because it um, indicates a certain kind of assimilation uh, into uh, uh, what is known as America. Uh, and of course, this isn't, this is not America. Mm -hmm. America is a hemisphere, right? Right. Thank you. Right. Uh, and so if by African American it meant people of the Americas of African descent, then I would say yes. But it, 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 mm -hmm. it doesn't even refer to people mm -hmm. in, in, to black people in, in, in Mexico or Central America. It doesn't mm -hmm. even refer to black people in Canada. It's this, it's this um, colonizing term that establishes America as the center, America, the United States mm -hmm. of, that is, as the center of, of, of the world. And, 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 and black is, um, is a term of solidarity. Uh, mm -hmm. There are black people all over the world. Black is also a political concept. Mm -hmm. it's, not, um, it's not a, a racial concept. Mm -hmm. it, it signifies struggle. It signifies um, a, a constant effort to move in the direction of freedom. Uh, and so that's why I prefer the term term black. Mm -hmm. So I asked it at least part yeah. of your question. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And I have to say, I have to say that our dear friend Betita would be so proud that we are making the distinction about America in what you say because she has fought tooth and nail to bring that consciousness to people that say, oh, we're, we're America, right? I mean that whole word. <laughs> And so, and, I'm sorry, I just, <laughs> um, but it's so insulting because it's like, yeah, the, the whole hemisphere, the whole continent is America. Uh, and it's, an, it's, it's another form of appropriation of, 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 of identity. And, and so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> thank you both. You both were political prisoners, as we know, as we say. Um, why, don't you, why don't you share about, like, how did you bo both deal with fear during your time in jail, Olga and Andrea? Um, <clears throat> well, okay. Um, I think the actual time in the prison, which um, I don't think that I that I remember as feeling fear, per se. Yes, so, sometimes yes, because, uh, and, and, but mostly came because of the uncertainty. So if, if I would think, because it was always very unclear whether, whether we could be released or whether we we're going to be transferred to another uh, prison or whether we we're going to go back to the torture chamber. Um, and, and the most, uh, the time that I was probably the most afraid was during the first uh, days. Uh, where there was uh, the, the torture, and and maybe in some ways, after that, it was almost like, well, this is just prison, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and so, but the, the, there was fear. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deny that there there was fear, but I think it was brought about mostly by what was happening on, in the out, on the outside. And so, because whatever was happening in Argentina at that time, repression was growing, absolutely, uh, every day. And so, as things would, would um, get more repressive in the outside, they became more repressive um, in, in, in prison as well. And um, I would say the, the way that we, that you, that we would um, overcome fear, we would, be, we would be afraid, wondering what is going to happen, and then many things could happen. You could be taken out, supposedly, to go to court and not come back. 
and that that started to happen. So there was those things that you could, um, and actually, I think the at the end of the time, what I was actually the most afraid was when I was released because I was put on a small airplane, and they had started already throwing people from airplanes, and so uh, in Argentina they did this, and so it was a small, just a small plane, just my, I was the only prisoner, and there were um, uh, soldiers and so on, and so I would say that's the one time that I thought. I wonder if this is it, you know. I uh, wonder if, this, if they're going to do this. Uh, unfortunately, of course, they didn't. Um, but I think uh, I, I think back on it, and a lot of it was the uncertainty. It's just not knowing what was going to happen, what to prepare yourself for. Uh, and a lot of times when, when, when I think when we have fear, but we know what may happen, you prepare yourself for it. And I think that the biggest fear is when you don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what your experience was. Well, you know, I, now, many years later, <clears throat> excuse me, I realized that it was a, a gift to have been able to experience uh, that imprisonment, that sense. I was charged with three capital crimes, uh, and so looming over was always the, the possibility of going to um, California's um, gas chamber, um, which is how people were killed in, 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 in those days by the state. Uh, uh, but I say that it was a gift because I really learned that one can be afraid and not allow fear to immobilize you. I learned that it's possible to be afraid and to continue and to, um, this is something that Audre Lord writes about, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that fear does not have to immobilize us. We do not have to be afraid of fear. Uh, and there were many, many moments when I did not know whether uh, I would be alive the next day. Uh, and as, um, as Olga pointed out, there is, I think, this cultivation of uncertainty uh, because they, they never tell you what is happening. They never tell you uh, 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 where they're taking you. Uh, and I had an experience with a plane as well when I was um, extradited from New York to, um, to Marin County. And... Um, I wasn't even told that I was getting ready to be uh, taken to uh, uh, a naval base and put on a, put on a um, um, National Guard plane. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, was simply, I was simply told that I had to go with the, the, um, the cops who came to get me. And I, I said, no, I refuse. I, I remember that evening I said, I know that my attorney has been um, in Washington before the Supreme Court contesting um, uh, uh, the, the ruling that I was to be extradited. And I said, I refuse to leave until I see my attorney. And they had actually told me to get me to leave my cell at one o'clock in the morning. They told me that my attorney uh, was there to visit me. Hmm. But as it turned out, he wasn't. Uh, there were a whole bunch of, 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 of of armed men, and uh, I refused to go. Um, and I also, um, I had learned some karate. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> you were right. You were right. <laughs> I used the opportunity <laughs> to employ. <laughs> and what was, what was really interesting was that there were two black women um, officers uh, uh, who, um, uh, were actually very supportive of me, and so they jumped into the fight, and they started to fight the men. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the fear came after they had taken me in a long caravan to this uh, 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 base, a uh, military base, and I realized that they had... Uh, uh, National Guards men standing in two uh, lines, and I had to walk mm. 
uh, through this uh, kind of gauntlet uh, in order to make it to the plane. And, um, and I was handcuffed behind my back, uh, and I had been handcuffed behind my back throughout the whole trip from uh, the jail there. And I kept thinking, well, suppose I trip. You know, suppose I take a false step. Uh, and I was certain that, that, that the guns would come out and for something as, as minor as that. So I, I, I really felt that I might not even make it to uh, the, the plane. And you, I mean, it's interesting you say that uh, uh, people were thrown out of the airplanes in, in Argentina. Uh, I was on this, uh, it's this uh, propeller plane, mm. and there was a woman they had sent from the jail, from the Wren County Jail, to accompany me. And when I um, had to go to the, the toilet, and the toilet was even smaller than the ones you have on commercial aircraft, this woman insisted on coming in with you, with me. <laughs> I remember I said, well, what do you think I'm going to do? Do you think I'm going to flush myself down the toilet or something? <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned that you learned uh, karate because... Um, <laughs> you did. No, it was interesting. Um, in, um, uh, when, we were, when I was in prison, one of the things that we did is we actually exercised a lot. As, as much as we could, sometimes we had to do it uh, where the guards could not see us. And part of the mentality was that um, we had to be ready to escape. Hmm. So, uh, and that was a re revolutionary duty, was to, uh, to be physically uh, you know, ready. Uh, but um, I'm not sure I could have done anything with karate against some guards, as, <laughs> as, as, as she did. <laughs> well, I wasn't the aggressor. <laughs> okay. You were defending yourself. I was no, defending okay. myself. Right. Okay, yes. that's it. <laughs> In yeah. those difficult times, you all had the support of your family, your community, and actually international support. How was it achieved? Well, Angela was part of my campaign to get me out, so that's, it. that's, why, I, that's why it worked. <laughs> no. No. Well, you know, during, during that period, there, was a, there were vibrant movements to free political prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, political prisoners, not only in the U.S., but in other parts of the world uh, as, as, as well. Uh, and I actually ended up uh, going to jail as a result of being involved in, in various campaigns to free uh, uh, members of the Black Panther Party, and then um, um, I was involved in Los Siete de la Raza, and then of course uh, um, uh, there was the Soledad Brothers case, which was the immediate uh, catalyst for uh, my going to jail. And I can remember, um, I was teaching at UCLA, and defending my right to teach there because I had been fired by um, Ronald Reagan and the Regents. Uh, my first job. Uh, <laughs> um, and I remember uh, speaking to people in various parts of the state uh, uh, about the case of George Jackson, uh, Fleet of Drumgo, uh, John Clouchet, and about um, the importance of creating a movement because I remember saying we never know who will be the next person targeted. Uh, mm -hmm. And I didn't realize when I was saying that that I was also talking about myself. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why so many people became involved in the campaign for my freedom had to do with the fact that I had been involved in the campaign, you know, to free uh, Lolita Lebron, to free the Soledad brothers, to free uh, the Chicago um, Seven, and 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 um, and so it was. Um, it was an amazing time. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, 
not only were all the members of my family, my father spoke, my mother especially, my sister who was pregnant, traveled all over the world, my two brothers, uh, my, I had one brother who was, uh, um, well, I still have this brother. Uh, he was a football player for the Cleveland Browns. Oh. And um, uh, Nixon had written him a letter uh, sympathizing with him for having uh, someone like me as a sister. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because uh, my brother refused to take the bait, he sat on the bench for an entire season. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so uh, it was, it was, it was, it was an amazing time. But people all over the world, all over this country, and I was uh, talking to uh, Olga about the fact that it was uh, the Chicano community in San Jose that was the, 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 the main basis of uh, support there. My trial took place in San Jose. And in those days, there were maybe about 10 black people in San Jose, I mean, you know, a few more. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was one in your was that, yeah. <laughs> uh, And so the, the primary organ happened in the Chicano community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the jury was all white with the exception of one person, and it was a Chicano man who played a major role in, 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 in the deliberations. Uh, um, so, you know, all over, uh, it, it, I mean, it was a time, it didn't have to do with me, I don't think. It was, I, I just happened to be uh, the person targeted at a moment when people were really prepared to move, uh, when they were fed up with the uh, repression and, 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 and the racism. Uh, uh, I don't think it was because of anything I did as an individual. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I tried to do what uh, I felt all of us should have been doing at, at the time, but uh, there were many other people who went to, ended up going to prison for many, many years who did not have that kind of support. Uh, so I was always aware of that. Uh, you know, when I would get a, a photograph in jail of uh, women in uh, Somalia demonstrating for my freedom, I still encounter people today who tell me what they did. Uh, you know, in 1970 and 1971 when I was in jail, and I feel so humbled by it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and I realized that, uh, that that was a moment when we, we, we were able to palpably experience the promise of global solidarity. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, and I, and I often say this, uh, that some of the most powerful men in the world wanted to see me walk into the death chamber. Mm -hmm. Richard Nixon was president, I already mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Who do you think was governor? Reagan. Ronald Reagan was governor. Who was the head of the FBI? And, and so that movement demonstrated that the, even though these were three of the most powerful men in the world, that they were nothing compared to the might of organized masses of people all over the world. And so, and so I don't think that the importance of that movement resided in the fact that it freed one individual, namely me. The importance resided precisely in the fact that it demonstrated what is possible if we, if, if we, if we come together. Yeah. Now, I was, um, I was freed on June 4th, 1972. And uh, it was an amazing moment. Uh, uh, but we celebrated that night and some of the jurors came to the celebration. <laughs> because they had gotten a political education during the course yeah, yeah, of the yeah. trial, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, 
Uh, but the next day, we sat down immediately to talk about how to um, harness the energy that was created around uh, uh, my case so that we would be able to use uh, 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 that momentum, that impulse to free many other people. And so uh, uh, when Olga's case happened in Argentina, you can say we were ready uh, to build the kind of uh, uh, movement, not only in the Bay Area, uh, not only in California, but all over the country and in other parts of the world demanding her freedom. Uh, uh, and um, there were so many other cases. As a matter of fact, the mural, uh, and uh, we haven't even talked about the fact that this is a, a benefit for both the uh, sure. Chicana Latina Foundation and the Maestra Peace uh, uh, mural. So th I feel so honored to be here. Thank you know both organizations. Uh, but in, you may have seen on on the uh, Lepage um, Street facade. Uh, a, uh, an image of Lolita Lebron mm -hmm. and, and Dilcia Pagan uh, and many other political prisoners. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I, I certainly benefited from exactly what you're talking about, Angela. Absolutely. That it was, um, it, it was the power of people coming together that began with good friends and um, in my family. When I was being interrogated, uh, this is so you, we understand also the power of the global and international connection among the repressive forces. They would say, oh, so you're one of those uh, Chavez agitators, huh? Mm -hmm. So they knew, mm -hmm. they had gotten that information. They had gotten it from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the reason why I was actually tortured was because they felt that no one would care. Mm -hmm. This is this young Chicana from Gilroy, farm worker parents. Mm -hmm. I cannot prove it, but there's no way that a U.S. citizen would be in that situation without the embassy knowing. Okay? That's true. So, so they said, who cares? Mm -hmm. Way down there in Argentina, who's going to know? And it was the absolute individual, collective, and ongoing work just against all odds of my family, my mom with her fifth grade education became the spokesperson. She went to Washington a couple of times. So there's all the letters and all the petitions and all the marches. And some of you here participated, I know, because I know some of you. And so it is absolutely what you're saying. I, I, there's no, no other way to explain it, but it is the power of mobilization and each individual putting you know, their uh, effort forward. And I, every once in a while, people say, oh, Catalamante, and they go, are you the one that <laughs> I wrote a letter for? And so it happens, sometimes it happens. And, but one of the things, uh, in terms of like, yeah, who, want, who, who wants to keep us in prison, right? They really did not want me to get out of there. But because of the power of the mobilization, and it was a timing kind of thing, uh, uh, that because the coup happened, when, when the military actually took over in 1976, it's ironic that that's when I was released. And I was released because there had been so much pressure by Congress, because we had some good Congress people, um, the, 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 uh, uh, the Black Congressional Caucus was the most active and supportive. Ron Dellums, Barbara Lee, Shirley uh, Chisholm, Barbara Dorton, I, all the, they were absolutely at the forefront. They got it. The people would say like, well, why are we worried about this person over there? She's a troublemaker. They totally got it. They knew exactly what was happening and they stepped forward. So when the coup happened in March, of, uh, March 24th, 1976, 
they started to take everything away from the prisons and stuff. We said, okay, the military is coming in for sure. And that was, that was a little bit of a fearful day. The military came in, they replaced all the, uh, the guards and so on. They came in, put us all into a hall, um, all the women, and said, who's the Talamante woman? <laughs> I, I considered not stepping forward, but <laughs> I said, <coughs> he, it's me, and he's the, the military guy said, so you're the one that Kissinger wants out. Big, he's the uh, Secretary of State. So, so much pressure had been applied. Mm -hmm. And really, the reason why he said, get her out of there, is because my case was calling so much attention to what was going on in Argentina. And so, they, they were pissed off because Kissinger was saying, get her out of there. That's how it happened. So, yes, we can bring those men to their knees. perceive that commitment to social injustice and all those struggles, is there a really, a, do you feel that is still that unity and commitment? Both women, men, Chicanos, blacks. Well, you know, um, we have to constantly renew those struggles. Uh, we can't assume that um, that what existed in the 1970s, uh, uh, the same you know, sense of solidarity uh, uh, will automatically emerge uh, in the 21st century. Uh, uh, I'm really excited about uh, the, the movements that have developed uh, over the last period. Uh, um, I'm excited about the fact that there is a, a, a very vibrant Black Lives Matter uh, movement that has uh, spawned many organizations, uh, uh, not only throughout the country, but in other parts of the world. I've met with Black Lives Matter people in Belfast, Ireland, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of reminiscent of the fact that when uh, the Black Panther Party was founded in, in 1966, uh, Black Panther parties were created in, um, in Brazil, in New Zealand, in um, Israel, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, but, you know, each generation has to... Um, rework its commitment, reconfigure uh, its way of imagining the future. And, and I'm very excited about what's happening now. I do, however, uh, wish that there were um, a greater sense of internationalism. Uh, it's very exciting that uh, the uh, Justice for Palestine uh, movement is so much more powerful than we ever could have imagined yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I think about the fact that in Brazil, uh, uh, well, before Bolsonaro was elected, uh, Marielle Franco uh, was assassinated. And there should have been an uprising here in this country uh, 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 in response to her assassination. Uh, and I keep thinking about uh, you know, why it is that, uh, that we don't often relate our of struggles against the repression of, of immigrants to you know, what is happening uh, uh, with respect to Syria and um, Libya. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, in a sense, it's so ironic that we have now the tools to communicate with right. people instantaneously right. all over the planet. And in, in those days, uh, uh, when we were fighting for Olga's freedom, when she was in a jail in Argentina, um, almost all communication was snail mail. 
<laughs> Seriously. Oh, yeah. It took a long time to get my letters. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but now that we have yeah. the technology to enact that kind of global communication, we need to use it. Uh, Yes, I'm actually dreaming of, uh, of, uh, of, of a far more vibrant uh, uh, global revolutionary movement. Um, and uh, hopefully this younger generation is moving in that direction. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, I would just add that, um, you know, having been the executive director of Chicana Latina Foundation for 15 years, uh, and before that I worked with Inroads, which is students of color also, um, that uh, that's where I put my faith in. I, I, and I'm just, I feel like, uh, inspired and, and so uh, privileged uh, to be able to be in with, with, with the, uh, the young people. And, and the young, gifted, and black, um, I mean, they're like, <laughs> they got it going on. And so, um, I think that, that I, I, I just hope that we can continue to uh, share some, some, some lessons. Both, both of us have been in, in organizations that, that have tried models of organizing. Uh, there are the new sort of like almost non-models <laughs> of organizing that I look at and, 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 and trying to understand um, also, well, what, what are the structures and, and what are the systems and what are the ways that people will organize? Um, I think I, I can't get totally, totally out of my head. Maybe you can help me. So, totally out of my head of that kind of organized structure to mobilize people and, and, and certainly do not want to go back to the dogmas of the past. My old lefty friends here and, um, you know, uh, party builders. Um, but uh, I, uh, it's, it's sort of also um, trying to understand uh, it's a new world and, and so on and and we did so much without the technology mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was because of that uh, the organized nature uh, that the, the we could mobilize ourselves and I'm not talking about the purely rigid you know uh, uh, structures but there was that kind of organized um, uh, method I, I, ha I have a lot of faith in, in what the young people are, are, are doing and proposing and and trying and and um, I just hope I can keep up with, uh, you know, with, with, with some of it. Uh, but uh, I, that's, I, I mean, I'm, I, I keep the faith. I'm and I hopeful. think that, that what's, what's good is that young people have feminist strategies. Mm -hmm. now, yes. yes. Which yes. we did not have no, we didn't. at that no, we time. Didn't. No, uh, we didn't. Uh, yeah. And yeah. that they understand yeah. the importance of making connections uh, and not uh, 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 focusing uh, on a single issues, but rather understanding the interrelationalities uh, that uh, there's no way that uh, we will ever end um, gender oppression without also ending racism. Uh, and I think that this is something that took a long time to arrive at that, you know, that understanding. But mm -hmm. this is why I, I, I really have so much faith in, in young people uh, who uh, take for granted what we struggle so hard to try to figure out. And now I, you know, I see these young people who, are, who, who take it and they run and they yeah. go to places we never could have imagined. Uh, right. So that's very exciting. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Black Lives Matter, and I, I have to say that I think, again, the, the feminist component um, of, of the uh, organizers uh, also, I think, is part of why I do believe that uh, it, the message of the, the importance of the centrality of black people's struggle has permeated and has gotten across. Not as, not, not as much as I even would like it to, but it, the fact that many of us do understand and totally um, support and are there 
for the fact that Black Lives Matter unapologetically and on its own without caveats about all the other lives that matter and so on, and to understand politically the importance of the black struggle to all of our struggles. And I think, it, I think it's because of that leadership that is done. And I'm not sure we could have done it. Um, yeah, and, and, and the, the, the meaning of Black Lives Matter, it's not simply about black people. Exactly. It's, if ever black lives can be made to matter, then I, all then lives would matter. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. But I do think, I do think that uh, it's, um, uh, that there, there, there's, a, there's some very um, specific uh, challenges to that movement. Uh, for example, understanding the connection between uh, racist police violence uh, and the repressive uh, racist violence of ICE. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because oftentimes we talk about police as if they were only the cops on the street. Right. Yeah. And we forget that uh, law enforcement is enormous. And we have to talk about state violence, racist state violence. And that means that we understand that if, if we challenge the police in the community, we also have to be willing to stand up. And if we say abolish the structures of policing, we, we mean first and foremost abolish ICE. And, and recognize and recognize that uh, this 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 emphasis on on borders is an attack on the humanity of all people. So I think that that, that and that's a feminist analysis uh, that that the, the intersectionality of struggles. Uh, that's right. Uh, and uh, I I um, I'm excited that that the, that younger organizers understand that leadership is not simply about some man, uh, and they're great men. I, yes. You know, but yes. the assumption has some, always there, been there's some here that, that yeah. leadership, yeah. <laughs> the, the assumption is, has been in the past that leadership is inherently masculine. Right. That you don't have leaders if you don't have men. And this is why uh, some of the old civil rights organizers who, who uh, went to Ferguson to talk about uh, you know, what the organizers there in 2014 had done wrong and what they, you know, what they should be doing. And they asked, well, where are the leaders? And, 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 and of course, the, the response was that, that, that our leadership is collective. As um, Ella Baker said, we don't need strong leaders if we, we are a leaderful, we're not a leaderless movement, we are a leader, leaderful mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so this notion of collective leadership that has come out of this feminist yeah. approach is something very new and uh, very promising. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Because I think we all know that women have always done the work. Yes. <laughs> yes. Every single yes. movement. Every movement. Every. <laughs> and I think the men should applaud that too, because if you were involved, you know, you know who really did the work. Now that you're talking about feminists, about women, I want to ask both of you, who are the most important women in your life? Well, um, certainly my mother comes to mind. Uh, she, um, she, and I, I didn't know this all the time um, because, you're, because of mother-daughter relations and so on. I think in retrospect, I mean, I always felt her, her great, um, she had a very a working class consciousness. And that was one of the things that just permeated how she looked at the world and how she did things, and her solidarity with other people, that people call compassion and um, you know, uh, helping others, others, which she always did. But in thinking about it and, and giving her, her her due as the political person that she was, 
it, it came out of that working class consciousness, out of the, the, the understanding of the relation that one has to the world, and who, who are you, and what power do you have? And so I would say that she uh, just uh, has left me with a, with a lot of uh, richness that I continue to learn from, that I continue to, to uh, reflect on. And I'll share just one small anecdote. When we, I was growing up, growing up in Mexicali, we lived in this little barrio, and across the street lived uh, uh, a woman who was what people would call a, cap, a kept woman. And most of the, uh, other, the people in the, in the street would not talk with her, would not talk to her, would not relate to her. You know, she was like, Ooh. Um, and I remember my mom just so like saying, who do they think they are? How, they don't know her. And she deserves to be respected and always in, in, instilled in us as the kids to definitely not be part of the taunting or the, 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 the laughing at and so on. And I have never forgotten that, just that, that ability uh, to see the human being to be in solidarity, and, and she says she's doing what she needs to do to, to uh, put food on the table. And that kind of, um, so I, I would say, you know, I mean, I could, I, I could name others uh, along the way. No, I, 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 I. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, we, we both uh, named Betita. Betita yeah. has been just a, a dear friend and, and such an amazing leader and, and, and such a strong voice in wanting to bring black-brown unity. And I know the two of you actually did presentations on that. And so that's another voice that I, that I carry with me. Um, as I do the work that I do and, and honor her uh, for everything that, that, that she did for the movement. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there uh, with just those two. Thank you. Well, maybe I should say a few words about my mother as well. Uh, you know, she was there for the trial. <laughs> I, uh, it took me a long time to realize that I was following in my mother's footsteps in so many ways. Uh, um, my mother, um, my mother was a foster child um, who grew up in the backwoods of Alabama, and um, she told us this story when we were growing up, and we'd say, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." Uh, <laughs> When she was 13 and graduated from elementary school, her foster parents felt that she needed to get a job because that's what people did in those days. Uh, um, but she was um, one of the, if not the smartest uh, child in her class. And we talked to some of her classmates who said that she was always the one the teacher left in charge. Uh, mm. And so she must have gotten this uh, inspiration to continue her education uh, from the educators who shaped her. Mm -hmm. So she literally ran away from home. You know, there weren't a lot of black high schools in, in, in those days. And the closest high school was uh, maybe 100 miles away in Birmingham, Alabama. So she basically <laughs> ran away to Birmingham um, got a job as a domestic that allowed her to pay for a room at the YWCA uh, in order to go to high school. Uh, and uh, in high school, the, the principal noticed her and eventually uh, supported her. Eventually, she went to live with the principal and his, and his wife, and they supported her um, um, higher education. So she ended up going to uh, an HBCU in Birmingham, Miles College. Uh, and then later, she, um, she got her master's at NYU uh, during the summer when she had three children and then four children, and she would take all of us to New York. Uh, and we lived with uh, close friends who were uh, black members of the Communist Party, whom 
they had met when uh, uh, the Burnhams had come to Alabama to organize uh, uh, during the late 1930s and early 40s, but they were run out of town by Bull Connor. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and so we spent like summers with them while my mother was uh, getting her master's at NYU. Uh, and can you imagine? Uh, this, is, this was a house with first six children and then eight children. Um, uh, but she also was an activist. And I kind of knew this, but I didn't know this. She became involved in the Scottsboro uh, case uh, uh, when she was in college. And she got involved with the Southern Negro Youth Congress, which was an organization that uh, uh, black members of the Communist Party had, had, had created. You see, uh, this is my connection with, with communism. <laughs> uh, and when, when I was young, I, you know, I knew all these communists, but I thought I was much more radical than they, so I never, it never occurred to me to join the Communist Party, because these were my parents' friends. Yeah. <laughs> you were like beyond communism. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, she had the opportunity to hear Du Bois speak, and uh, so I, but growing up, I always, you know, I fought with my mother, and, uh, uh, but I ended up leaving um, to go to high school in New York. <laughs> um, and I realize now why she was so willing to let us go, uh, all of the children, uh, at, at such a young age, because she had, she had already had that experience. Uh, and during, during, my, um, during the, my case, she traveled all over the country. My sister was in, in Europe and in, 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 in Latin America and in other places organizing. And my mother had my sister's um, nine-month-old baby uh, traveling around the country. So there, there's a wonderful picture of her holding Issa as an infant in one hand and her fist. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I realize uh, the older I get, the more I realize that uh, my mother was the one who paved this path mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. me. And when I was growing up in Birmingham, she always told us, uh, this is an answer to the racism question earlier on, uh, when, we, when we wanted to, an explanation for why things were the way they were, she always said, you may not be able to go into the library now, but this is not the way things are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You may not be admitted to the amusement park, but this is wrong. This is not the way things are supposed to be, and they will be different. So she taught us how to imagine um, a different future. Mm -hmm. I always say that's why I, I, I began to study uh, philosophy and critical theory, because from the time I was very young, I was able to exercise my imagination and in, in inhabiting this, this space of intense racism, but at the same time um, uh, inhabiting an imaginary space mm -hmm. in which racism uh, would have been conquered. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I guess, I guess my mother is my major influence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cute for our moms. Phenomenal women, right? <laughs> well, why don't we take a look to America, the continent? There's so much going on on the international level. In a few hours, Mexico, my country, will have a new president and will have the highest concentration of female lawmakers in Mexican history. In Argentina, it seems like a football game gets more attention, media, media attention, than the feminist sites. In Brazil, as you already mentioned, Angela, they have a president homophobic, misogynist, racist, and in Chile, the, Ma the Mapuches, the originally people, the indigenous, are battling for their land. Can you comment about it? Both, Olga, Angela? Do you want to? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually, I'm going to, um, I'm going to Brazil on Tuesday uh, to participate in the 30th anniversary conference of the first uh, gathering of, uh, of Afro-Brazilian women. Uh, and, um, you know, Brazil was such, 
a hope for the future. And in many ways, for those of us who follow what was going on in Brazil, it was, it was similar to South Africa in the sense that we imagined South Africa as being the hope of the planet. Um, and you know, things never turn out the way um, we assume they will. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned Marielle um, uh, Franco, who was assassinated last uh, March. And I think it's important to realize that she wasn't targeted as an individual. She was targeted because of the, 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 the feminist movement, uh, the LGBTQ movement uh, in, in Brazil. And I guess what I would say is that I, I hope we're able uh, all over the world to harness uh, the, the promises that we don't forget, that we don't forget here in this country that just because we have someone uh, at, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue uh, uh, who uh, is not fit for anything, really. <laughs> not for anything. <laughs> I mean, that that does not mean that we let go of our dreams. And that that does not mean that we, 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 we forget what it is we have achieved over the years. Uh, and the, 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 the promises, the dashed promises, have to constitute an agenda for revolutionary change in the present and in the future. We cannot allow the, uh, the uh, uh, people like Trump and Duterte and, and Bolsonaro to, um, to make us forget uh, you know, what it is uh, we need to continue fighting for in, 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 in the world. And you know, I just, um, where was it? I reading a New York Times article, something like, uh, uh, 80% of the people in this country believe that, pri that climate change is responsible for uh, you know, all of the disasters that we've been experiencing, even though we have a president who is a denier. Uh, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's, that it's not the majority of the people. I still have faith mm -hmm. in people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and unfortunately, there are demagogues like uh, Trump and Duterte and Bolsonaro who are able to uh, uh, unfortunately seduce people uh, by making promises that will never be kept anyway. Um, but I think our job is to do the organizing and to make that organizing global and to recognize uh, that we, we need to join hands with people in, 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 in Brazil. And we need to know what is going on in Colombia. We need to know about the land struggles, uh, the deterritorialization of indigenous people and, and, and African descended people in, in, in Colombia. Uh, and we need to celebrate because in Costa Rica, they did have uh, um, a, a promising election last spring, and they elected the very first black woman in all of Latin America to the vice presidency, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Etsy Campbell. Uh, so there are things to celebrate. Yes. <laughs> I, I, all I would add is that um, I hope that we continue to um, keep in mind the lessons um, from the Vietnamese people uh, from many decades ago as we were uh, in solidarity with those struggles who always made a distinction between the people and the governments. And that's part of what formed the solidarity movements that then extended to Latin America. And you're right, um, Angela, that I, I, in reflecting from what you were saying, it's like we had, especially here in the Bay Area, such a vibrant mm -hmm. uh, solidarity movement, um, in, certainly to Latin America, but, uh, but for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we have to um, we, in, in, we have to make sure that we keep that alive, and especially because of things like what's happening with the caravan, where where they're able to change the narrative to demonize and, and make it totally okay to tear gas families and children, and it seems it's just like why aren't we like just in a total uproar over that, and to look at the conditions that have been caused largely by these governments of this country, of this US, not America, uh, towards the peoples and the countries of Central America. They're driving them in desperation here. And so if this is part of the conversation to make sure that, that our movements uh, here are imbued with that kind of consciousness, an international consciousness, an international solidarity. So um, I appreciate you very much, Angela, for always having that very clear perspective. In and you the, know, you know, and it's happening all over the world, too. Uh, I, I was just, uh, I just remembered I was in uh, Madrid a, a couple of weeks ago. I was invited by the Association of Guatemalan Women. Mm. Uh, who are leading the struggle mm -hmm. in Madrid uh, uh, for the rights of, of, of migrants. Oh, migrants. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so I yeah. had the opportunity when I was there to visit a, a, a migrant detention center and to talk to people who were being, mm -hmm. being held there. And this is, a, this is a struggle in Spain being led by women from Guatemala. Right, right. Uh, yeah. And one of the points that is being made all over Europe is that um, Europe is no longer white. You know, Europe was never really white. It was really white. It was right. never really white, right. but we always imagined Europe as white. Right. Uh, but it's very clear now uh, uh, that, that, that Europe has to let go of, of its whiteness. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And some of the most Im important leadership to a whole range of movements comes from um, what we call women of color. Right. Right. And I say what we call women of color because that's not a term that is used uh, all, all over the world. Right. Um, women of the global south, uh, right. uh, you know, women from, from, uh, from uh, the Middle East. Uh, and um, that's actually exciting. That's pretty exciting that, that we happened to be alive at a moment when there is an uprising of women all over the world. Uh, right. Uh, you know, when sexual violence, sexual violence and sexual harassment will no longer be taken for granted. Uh, right. Thank you. And so it also means that there are new models of masculinity that are emerging. Mm -hmm. It also means that we're challenging um, the, the, the gender binary with which we have lived for so many centuries mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and movements of, of, of people who identify as trans or, or, or gender nonconforming are leading us in directions uh, that we could have never imagined. Yeah. And that's really exciting. Yeah. close the conversation and I would ask you my last one. We just one. started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we just got to the non-binary stuff. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we okay. want to know, or I want to know, what gives you hope every single day to continue resisting, Olga and Angela? And with that, we close the conversation. Um, I, I anguish almost every day. I do anguish, I, and I and I worry, um, and and then I get onto that uh, that other side um, by thinking of how important it is that we do keep fighting, that we do keep resisting, that we do keep organizing, that we do keep uniting, that we do keep collaborating, that we do keep learning. And uh, pretty much by midday, I'm kind of ready to, uh, 
hit the road. <laughs> um, but I, I sort of, uh, that's like, it, you know, it's like, I, it, there's no alternative. I, there's no alternative, and, and other people have not had the luxury of an alternative. And I, and I take that with a lot of humility uh, with, in terms of my own privilege of, of where I am and, and, and where I live and, and, and uh, what I'm able to live. Uh, and so I, I take that uh, as part of, uh, of, of our responsibility. And, and, uh, and I do find joy in, 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 in what we do. Uh, in, in, in how we do organize and how we work with each other. I, I find joy in that, and I find joy in being here with you, Angela, and you're such an inspiration. And so if you stay with it, I'll stay with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me say that it's, 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 it's such an honor to be here with you, uh, Olga. You know, who would have known when we met each other in 1976 uh, that we would both still be in, mm -hmm. in the struggle? How many mm -hmm. years later is that? Yeah, I know. I stopped <laughs> counting the years. Yeah, yeah. 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 42 years later. Um, um, but, you know, um, I, I am inspired by, by young people, and I, I said a few words about that before, but I'm also inspired by the ways in which uh, we are encouraged to, uh, to use our imaginations uh, by artists and musicians. Uh, you know, we're here, we're here to celebrate the Maestro Peace uh, mural. Uh, and, and that mural, how many of you have seen the mural? Well, you should go back again. <laughs> because that mural was so prescient. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 when it was painted in, in, in 1993, 1994, um, we had not arrived at this uh, moment where we could actually witness a women's uprising mm -hmm. all over the world. But the mural tells us, the mural yeah. tells us that there will be change and women will be the participants and indeed also the leaders of that change. We couldn't have, I don't know whether we could have said it in this kind of language at that time, mm -hmm. but the artist invited us to imagine uh, what we are now experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way in which mm -hmm. art has a, a, a vision of the future before we're able to actually articulate it with uh, the, the, the discursive language that we use. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very moved by artists, by visual artists, by uh, musicians, uh, uh, the, young, the young women uh, from Young, Gifted, and Black, which mm -hmm. all, of course uh, always makes me think about Nina Simone, mm -hmm. uh, right. uh, who, yeah. who also, uh, presaged and prefigured so much of what we are experiencing now. Uh, and so art allows us to inhabit the future uh, before we really know how to describe you know, what it is uh, uh, we're looking for. Uh, and it, 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 it helps us to sense ourselves as connected. Um, we get a sense of what community means uh, uh, when, we are, when we experience together a work of art, whether it's a film, whether it's a, a mural, you know, whether it's a, a music. Uh, so that is what uh, um, convinces me that there is a better future ahead. Uh, yeah. All and right. that, and that probably, you know, 
25 years from now, uh, people will be saying, well, what was that name of that crazy man who was elected, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, tr and tried to reverse the direction of history but did not succeed? Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Chelis. Applause for Chelis, yes. please. Thank you. Thank Masterful. You. Thank, Thank you. Masterful. Thank you.